good morning everybody thanks dr neeraja uh, what i will be highlighting here is essentially uh, learning curve in robotic gynae onco programs as how how to go about it and what i'll be highlighting a little bit because i am somebody who has moved on uh, from an open surgeon uh, to become a robotic surgeon so i think i will i'll put down my experience as, as to what can actually what help me and what can actually help you in case if you are moving from open to to robotic because i think uh, the learning curve uh, in my view is, is totally different if you are moving from open to robotic as against you are moving from doing a <coughs> advanced laparoscopic surgery to robotic surgery now i think these are the indications for robotic in gynae oncology endometrial cancer cervical cancer you can use it for radical trachelectomies there have been reports of using it for staging for ovarian cancers uh, pelvic excentrations and groin node dissections i think the first two uh, you all would agree are are the most common indications for which we are going to use robotic surgery now learning robotic surgery in my view has has three different components one is is understanding the technology how the equipment works the second one is about setting up the equipment in in terms of equipment calibrations how to go about doing the drapings of the arms you know the port placements and and the docking and last you know then you move on to develop specific procedural skills now understanding the robotic technology i think it's there are two things you know one is most importantly how how does a robot look like how are how are the connections you know in terms of robotic systems to the uh, the to the ports you know uh, connecting it to the visual cart and 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 to the robotic console we must understand the basic troubleshooting you know for every now and then you know you don't have to rush i think we must know how to go about base doing basic troubleshooting and and most importantly to understand the limitations of the technology i think you know many a times uh, you know as a surgeon the limitations of the technology are essentially taken as limitations of your skills and i think we should be able to differentiate between what you can do with the robot and what you cannot do with the robot then the next component comes is is preparing the system for the surgery so here uh, the component is about patient positioning i think for robotic surgery you need a slightly different positioning as you see for for general laparoscopic surgery you need to give a steep head low so now not only you but your anesthetist also has to be prepared to give you know that kind of head low the the important thing that i found you know in in my first few cases i really struggled with the uterine manipulator systems because you know with no tactile sensation you need some guiding force in the vagina for you to get into the right plane so i think we all have to be very careful about the uterine manipulators or that we use because not only it helps you in terms of manipulating the uterus but the most important difficult step for me in learning was getting into the right uretro uh, uterovesical plane and if you have a good distensor of the vagina i think that just gives you a feel and then you get into the correct plane so i think it 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 is important for first 15 20 cases and then you sort of learn with it draping i think this is this is part of the team port placements i think for almost all the robotic surgeries the port placements are standard as as gynecologist we all are used to putting ports so i don't think that that's something docking uh, you know again it's part of the team but what you must also teach the team is in terms of emergency and docking because you are likely if you land up with trouble you should have a team ready which should be immediately undock the robot and and then you can go in immediately to to handle the problems and the next important thing would be to develop the procedural skills and in here again a proper case selection and i'm 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 only talking about your your first 15 20 25 cases i am not talking about once you are experienced robotic surgeon you can do whatever you want but in first ye uh, case you have to be honest with yourself you know in terms of what you can do you know i i would advise you to start with with simple hysterectomies just to get the feel what well, that's what i did and then while doing simple hysterectomy you you open the retroperitoneal spaces uh, you know get well how to go about dissecting the vessels identifying the ureter if you can tackle the uterine at its origin so what i did was before i actually did my first uh, radical hysterectomy i almost did all the other steps except the ureteric dissection so so that was the only part of the radical hysterectomy that i had to do when i did my first radical hysterectomy pre operative preparation i think there will be a lot of views about whether to prepare bowel or not i personally feel you must give bowel preparation in in your initial cases because bowel coming inside your field to have control on the instrument it becomes extremely difficult so give bowel preparation steep head low that just keeps the bowel out of the field learning procedural steps i think it's it's a gradual process and again once more i would like to highlight is understand the limitations 
you know, understand the limitations of the technology, understand that you are, you are doing it for the first time, so be very careful with your case selection because, you know, it, it's very, as, as Som Shekhar said, you know, when you are starting, because almost all the hospitals will be having it new, everybody will be watching you, you will be under stress, so, you know, try to reduce the stress at least by doing a proper case selection, you know, in terms of uh, doing your cases. You know, there are various aspects of this training. You can learn this training in laboratories. I think that's how the, the Institute Surgical takes you. you. They take you to the dry lab and then you move on to the animal lab. I personally do not have an experience with virtual trainer, but there are studies which suggest, you know, that it's extremely good. Uh, proctoring, I, we all have been proctored and I, I think that's a fantastic way of learning. It's a little bit expensive, but when you have an experienced robotic surgeon, you know, just sitting next to you and guiding you to go through the procedure, it just gives you that extra bit of confidence in terms of, you know, taking the risks in your, in, in your initial case. And last but not the least, evaluation. I think we all, the most important thing is, you know, once you finish a procedure, just go back, take the videos, watch it, take the note where you struggled and, and how you can actually improve it, you know, the next time when you actually uh, do the procedure again. Most importantly, I think, a team effort. I mean, you must have a great team, you know, and, 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 and because the learning curve of everybody will move on together. Your sisters will learn along with you, your assistants will learn along with you. So you need a good anesthetist, you know, who will not be hesitant in terms of giving a good head load. You need a dedicated scrub nurse in the initial phases. The bedside assistant is somebody who should have a very good laparoscopic skills. I mean, because, you know, he, he will not be getting the three-dimensional vision that you are getting. So I think he has to have very good laparoscopy skills. You need a good uh, technician who would be, you know, well-versed with handling uh, the, the equipment. And all this has shown in studies that it reduces the operative time as well as the surgical error. Now, here I would like to add one point that I, that helped me because, you know, we, when, when we, I started doing it, our uh, euro onco surgeons, uh, Dr. Yuraj, was already established in terms of his robotic surgery program. So it was a, it, it, it's a great help if you have a couple of surgeons who are who are already trained or who are learning along with you. I also had Dr. Anshumala, who is an ex excellent laparoscopic surgeon, who was also starting doing robotic surgery. I think it helps you, you know, if you have a, a somebody who can who can guide you when when you get stuck in your in your initial cases. Now, what do you actually mean by learning curve is essentially refers to the number of surgical procedures performed before a surgeon reaches an accepted plateau in terms of outcome parameters, you know, in terms of operating time, the blood loss and the complications. And, and I think the length of the learning curve, you know, it will be different for difficult, different procedures and it will also be impacted by various factors. Most importantly is the complexity of the procedure. You all would agree, you know, learning simple hysterectomy would be far more easier than, than doing a, a radical hysterectomy. The surgeon's experience with similar technology, I think, as I said, I, mean, I firmly believe if you are a laparoscopic surgeon, it helps you in terms of your, your learning curve with robotic surgery. Now, familiarity with the procedure performed, I think if, irrespective of whichever way you have done, but if you have done enough radical hysterectomies, I think you have a fairly good idea about the surgical planes, where to expect what. So I think you should try doing procedures where you are very comfortable, you know, doing it in, in an open surgery. I think volumes are very critical. There is no point in doing one robotic surgery today and then, and then doing your next surgery after one and a half months. I think you at least have to do one surgery a week, you know, for first 25 to 30 cases because that helps you in terms of improving your learning curve rapidly. Availability of theater time, I think people who are in private sector, they would find it extremely difficult. So you have to work with your systems in terms of, you know, they have to allow you to absorb your learning curve in terms of making the theaters available. And last, again, I would highlight the importance of, of the teamwork. Now, the issue is, is does prior laparoscopy training shorten the learning curve? The evidence would suggest otherwise. In my view, if you are a laparoscopic surgeon, you know, the only thing that you have to learn is, is how to maneuver with the newer instruments in a three-dimensional setup. If you are moving from open surgery, the first thing you have to change is your mindset because you are used to opening the abdomen, feeling the tissues with your hand, and suddenly you move on to a robotic surgery where you have no feel of the tissues and, 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 and you, you can be all at sea in, in first four or five cases. Trust me. So I, I do believe that because if you have a mindset of somebody who is doing surgeries through a hole or, or through a, you know, a sort of a camera, I think it, 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 it helps you. So what you have to convince if you're moving from open surgery to robotic surgery is that I, I, I am going to complete it because it is extremely difficult for first five to 10 cases to get used to the new vision and the new system. 
Now the parameters evaluated to assess surgical proficiency is operative time, blood loss are an adequate indications of, uh, uh, of evaluating the learning curve. Probably no because as you would move on, you would try to take slightly more difficult cases so that would, that would sort of you know, uh, compensate the result. The number of surgeries to be performed to gain surgical proficiencies. I think it would be different for different procedures, but on an average, we all would agree it's about 25 to 30 procedures for you to sort of stabilize with your operating time. And critical volume, as I said, you have to do at least one surgery, but minimum 30 surgeries a year for first one or two years for you to, in order to move a little quicker with your learning curve. Now, there are two procedures, as I said, most commonly done the endometrial cancer staging and, and, and the radical hysterectomy. Now for radical hysterectomy, apart from the surgery, there are three or four critical steps in my view. Uh, the ureteric dissection, complete dissecting the ureter completely, dissecting the bladder beyond what we do for, for a normal hysterectomy. Uh, posterior dissection where you dissect the rectum completely, uh, the parametrial dissection and the vaginal cuff excision. This essentially, you know, sort of decides, uh, you know, uh, the adequacy of your surgery. And, and the number of cases that you are required for uh, surgical proficiency in a radical hysterectomy are not yet fully established, but there is a study which was published, you know, very recently, uh, where they evaluated their outcomes about 65 cases of uh, 1B1 uh, cervical cancer. The mean operating time was 190 minutes and, and there were no conversions. And I think what, what they observed in, in, in that study is, is the the learning curve was totally, or the phase, they divided it into first 28 and the next 28 cases, and, and there was significant reduction in terms of uh, their operating time, in terms of the blood loss, in terms of the console time. So I think about 25 to 28, that should be the number before you, you can expect reduction in, in terms of uh, time as well as, as well as the blood loss. Now here again, for, from my end, the suggestions would be, once again, Careful case selections go with smaller tumors. You know, don't try to go for four or five centimeter, which would be either ways, you know, difficult to do. Again, vaginal manipulator, this is particularly valuable for a radical hysterectomy because you have to take the vaginal cuff. And I, I particularly found the VKR extremely helpful in terms of using it because it has two cups and it just sort of guides you because the moment you pass on from the one first cup to the next, you would obviously get an adequate vaginal margin. I used extra assistant port for my initial four or five cases of radical hysterectomy because I really struggled in terms of getting the ureter, particularly on, on the left side. Uh, use harmonic for ureteric dissection because, as I said, you know, however safe uh, the monopolar or the bipolar cautery is, when you are learning, you know, there may not be adequate control that you have achieved on the tip of the instrument. So it's always better to use harmonic scalpel for your initial cases. If you are using cotteries, don't go for long, use only short burst of cotteries and, and keep the field dry. I think the most difficult and most of the times, ureteric injuries happen when you try to dissect the ureter in a bloody field. Okay, so I think you, you, there is no harm in, in taking a couple of gauze pieces, keep the field dry, identify what you are doing with the instrument articulation, allows you to do a great dissection. It's just being patient, uh, you know, during that phase. And as I said, 25 to 30 cases would be good enough, uh, you know, to achieve surgical proficiency for radical hysterectomy. For endometrial cancer, I, I think this is probably the most widely used indication for robotic surgery in our setup. Uh, the biggest problem is, as, as I asked Shom Shekhar, was, uh, was doing op surgeries in high, uh, uh, patients with high BMI, the obese and morbid, morbidly obese patients, and where you need to do a paraortic node dissection. I found it extremely difficult uh, to go up to the above the IMA, with, with the single uh, docking system because eventually, as I said, the bowels would come in and, and then you would be extremely scared. So we tried a couple of cases with double docking where uh, you, you dock the robot, uh, you know, swift it completely and dock it from the head end and then the assistant stands between the legs and lifts the bowel with the instruments. I found it, it easier. Obviously, I haven't done enough uh, to be saying that that's the way to go forward. But I think you have to find out what essentially works out for you. But I, I feel that's a good option in case if you are struggling with, with, with a single docking system. Again, you know, this, this was the analysis of uh, uh, robotic hysterectomy with pelvic and paraortic node dissections. You know, again, they have divided the cases into 20-20 uh, groups, and I think there was a significant improve, uh, improvement in terms of operating time, the lymph node dissection, the blood loss after the first 20 cases. So I, and, and, and the most important thing I found uh, you know, normally you would expect that you would take longer time to learn the lymph node dissection, particularly the paraortic. 
but the longest learning curve was was essentially observed for for hysterectomy uh, because as I, again I, as i said because you know in in lymphadenectomy you know it, it's much easier because the anatomy is more or less you know uh, mathematical okay most of the time with hysterectomy when you have to dissect and as i said i mean i, I think everybody uh, you know uh, would agree that getting into the planes when you have no tactile sensation can be difficult in your initial cases so that's why probably the learning curve was probably longer uh, with with the hysterectomy and and the cuff closure uh, and and there th this is the sgo uh, documentation in terms of their uh, you know sort of issued a statement <clears throat> developed by the sgo clinical practice robotic task force they uh, they dealt with the clinical impact of robotic surgery in gynec cancers and they all agree we all agree that it is making an impact and that's the way to go forward they have uh, you know sort of <coughs> highlighted the learning curve and the training that is required because you don't want a great machine in the hands of uh, you know uh, people who are not adequately trained or have not uh, for for robotic surgery there was cost analysis and credentialing obviously we do not have credentialing as of now by the institution but i think most of the institutions will follow certain protocols in in order to decide who should be allowed uh, you know to perform uh, robotic surgery so this would be my last suggestions again once i would highlight for your initial cases be very very careful with your case selection it's it's very difficult uh, you know to start a robotic surgery and and get back you know convert into an open surgery so be you know at at a lower end of your threshold again uterine manipulator most important in my view for your initial cases use bowel preparation have a good assistant be very friendly with your anesthetists so that they can give you a maximum Trendelenburg's position because they are very hesitant to do that. I, I think the most important thing, there are a lot of videos that are available. You know, watch a video of a procedure the day before you operate. I think that, that just gives you an idea as to how, how you can prepare, you can sort of visualize in your mind. And most important is analyze your surgery very objectively. Watch your videos immediately post-operatively because your memory is fresh. You would be able to highlight and make a note of mistakes that you have made. I, I, as I said, you know, it, it's very difficult to go through learning curve of anything. I mean, whether it's driving or whether it's learning robotic surgery. But we all have to go through it. And there are certain things, you know, which, which can help you in terms of reducing the learning curve and reducing the disappointment. Once we understand the limitations of all the technologies that we are using and how to overcome it, I think uh, there is no way we, uh, it, it can be stopped. I, I thank you all for a patience.